will ask some stupid questions and confuse you. That'd be great. I'm guilty of exactly what he talked about in the past too. So I know yeah. exactly what you're saying, you know, yeah. trying to check everybody's bite as your first thing that they walk in the door. Like, man, maybe this shit doesn't matter right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we put the two tongue depressors on the left and two tongue depressors on the right and none on the right. And how does that change your internal rotation? Cool. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like fun. Uh, awesome. Let's get going. And this is so I can see the recording. Yep. Yep. And <laughs> action. <laughs> Welcome to the Anatomy of Therapy. I'm Dr. John Sobolski here with Bobby Riley up in Iceland. And today we have a very special guest, uh, a very dear friend of mine, uh, Dr. Offenberger. We're going to talk about a couple, uh, well, we're probably going to talk about some weird things for sure. But one of the big things we want to get in today is, uh, you know, how do you get out of the textbook and into the clinic and treating life? Like, what is it? What's the difference between some of the theory and some of the practice? Getting actual results and, and kind of seeing patients for who they are. How, how are we going to wheel down all the variables that you've he heard in the textbooks, all the variables you're seeing on Instagram and all those things? How do we wheel it down to something useful uh, and something that, you know, hopefully you can help your patients with? Uh, later today in practice but uh welcome steve thank you i'm excited and like i said earlier a little nervous to be here uh i have listened to you guys and you guys have gotten so much better at this and talk so well so hopefully i don't blunder through this and uh don't sound like an idiot no so no no maybe well, i should just not talk and then i won't sound like an idiot <laughs> no 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 you're the guest that's what's supposed to happen but i think more specifically in terms of uh, wielding things down, we'll, we'll, we'll try to refine it into hips and, and maybe kind of something like hip extension. I think we, we kind of all agree one of those major kind of lacking things. Like if you go back to our episode with Dr. Askey, he talks about his big three and a half and talks about dorsiflexion, uh, thoracic rotation. And one of his was, uh, was hip extension as being one of these crucial things to look at. Um, I guess my first question is, well, why is hip extension important? I mean, what, what, what is it, what is about the hip? What is it about extension that, that you think people need to pay attention to? Yeah, I think maybe, and sometimes it's not that you need a ton of hip extension. You just need to not suck at hip extension, depending on your workload or how much, uh, you know, how much load you're putting through the system. Um, I think it's just the, the place that I always start with, you know, over years of practice, it became this thing where it didn't matter what I tested, right? I would test the person and I would test their hip extension, but then I would put them in a position of hip extension and they didn't have it. Um, and so I stopped testing for it and I just started to make every single patient try to get it. Uh, and that taught me more about my lack, my, my lack of skill in being able to test something and the body's ability to cheat around tests and how many times we're wrong when we do these tests. And maybe instead of trying to, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about making everything so complicated that every case is so unique and I got to find all these different things. Like same what Nick said, um, you know, the big three sometimes just try them and see what happens. And you'd be very surprised at how many people are really bad at those things. And that probably is a huge contributor because if you stand on two legs and you're not in a, you know, if you're, if you're not in a pool, you need hip extension of, of sorts, right? Uh, it's your balance against gravity and the way to motive or to move yourself forward in space. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it's the lack of hip extension that really is the problem uh, on a lot of things. And over time, it can accumulate cumulatively to a more compensatory pattern in lots of weird areas. So, so it's the so, thing I always go to. Well, when you, okay, so when you say kind of the, I'm hearing kind of a passive test versus like an active position, uh, like, so are you talking about maybe like a passive test? We're talking about like a scour test or something like that, where you're kind of pushing the hip around versus maybe like a Thomas test passively, uh, something like that, uh, you know, on the table where you can move them around and you can feel what you feel. Um, yeah. What, 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 what are you talking about? The active position that you are, you're kind of referencing here. You know, I started always going into uh, that modified kind of hip flexor stretch where you're taking the quad and putting it at length. Um, 
because people would, they would get into Thomas test. They would get into all these different positions on my table. And it's like, oh, I could kind of feel something. I think I feel something, but there's so many joint articulations and angles that the body can change in order to get that little bit of what you feel as hip extension. But once you put them in a position to try to use hip extension, when all other joints are locked, that's very hard. And so, you know, I, I, I do. I just, I, and I'm, and I'm not good at testing a lot of things anymore because I, I got away from testing a little bit. Um, I almost more, let's just say, I don't use a lot of orthopedic tests when I don't think that there's an orthopedic problem. If it's a movement problem, I should probably test it with a movement to see what happens. Uh, but locking that movement into place so that I can see more and not, I guess, I guess judge less, you know, like make it less about me seeing something and make it more about the patient being able to feel something and know that they have a problem there. Bobby. Yeah. yeah it's quite evident. Uh, like I did with, with uh, my recent post that, that we were talking about before we started recording, getting active hip extension was kind of what the post was about versus like demonstrating the ability to extend passively or through some angulation that you were talking about, I was having them basically drive the foot into the wall behind. And you can sometimes get an adductor magnus that freaks out or a hamstring that freaks out and, or a back that starts to hurt as they're pressing. And yeah. you can, the strategy just becomes evident that, okay, you don't push off or extend actively ever, even if you do have access to it. But, it, and John and I have talked about like this, idea of evolutionary mismatches this idea that that we have these this this pro this painful product of modernity that is giving us these problems like so my question to you be why do you have to do why do we have to find hip extension on almost everyone like where does this come from and you know what i mean so it's, it's even a precursor to why is hip extension important it's why is everybody losing it do you know what i mean do you have an answer well, to that yeah. or? i mean i i I don't because I think it's odd to find highly athletically functional people who don't have it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why they wouldn't have it. They seem to be using it in practice. Uh, but then when you test for, I mean, you know, when they come in, I know that they have a problem because they're in my clinic, right? Like if you didn't have a problem, you wouldn't be here. So I don't know why everyone's losing it. You know, everybody says that the sitting and all of these different things are contributing to it. Maybe it is. Um, maybe it's our total lifestyle. Uh, we don't walk as much. I mean, there's, there's, I think it may be the one place in the body that is the easiest thing to lose very quickly too. Um, mm -hmm. Since we don't, I mean, I've lived in Asia, so we don't sit on the floor like they do. And I will say that they actually don't have it, a problem with it. It's a, it seems to be a Western thing. Um, because it's the more you're on the ground, I guess, maybe that's the answer then, I, I guess, in a roundabout way our total Western lifestyle of just being um, not hip mobility. And the one thing that will go the quickest is hip extension through there. I mean, yeah, you can't, it can't be just genetics and the Scottish hip versus the Polish hip, right? Because like when I was over there with you in Bali, or I still remember this lady in Hong Kong, she's got, she had to be at least 90. I mean, she looked 200, she looked like Methuselah. <laughs> and uh, she's in, the deepest, you know, just picture the deepest snatch in Olympic weightlifting, that like a weight pushing you down into the squat. And she's down there selling newspapers, never comes up from that position. And I'm like, okay, maybe she has a shallow hip, a Dalmatian hip, sure. But that is a byproduct of lifestyle, right? right. Um, but where I want to go back to something more, like, where do you go with these basic testing? Like, first, like your first line of defense I know you said you, you don't really test now. You kind of just, no. you know, I mean, where do you go for the first, let's say, uh, re, like source for them to try to access it again? So let's say they are lacking hip extension. Where do you go first before you go too crazy? I go, I go into the passive or, you know, I, I always call this the wall stretch, you know, that's just what I've always called it, but it's a modified what Kelly Starrett's couch stretch, you know. Um, I modified it because I, I, I felt like patients would cheat the couch stretch, you know, depending on how, how far their knee was away from the wall. So I always go into passive, um, passive hip extension on a fully locked out or fully flexed knee. So 
if you're against the wall, your knee is against the wall, your foot is completely uh, flat against the wall. So every other joint along the line has been locked out. And then you have to drive hip extension from a feet or from a, a hip that is neutral, you would say. Uh, because there's a lot of ways to get hip extension with the hip, but I'm looking for extension of a femur on a pelvis that is neutral. That's the one place that I go to every time. So I guess as a stretch or an exercise, I always use the wall stretch on everyone just to see if they can passively get that joint articulation into extension and get that pelvis to come back up into neutral. So do you, go ahead. Sorry, John, do you, follow, do you follow it up with something active right away or not till later? You know, I, you know, I thought we would probably get into this on the podcast the population that I deal with or have always enjoyed dealing with, no, I don't. I like chronic pain and usually general population people. Um, you know, and to kind of John's point of like getting out of the textbook, I think a lot of textbooks, a lot of blogs, a lot of podcasts, a lot of things out there are always geared toward the athletic population. And I don't disagree that they're completely correct on everything that they talk about. Um, but when I have a 45-year-old man that needs to go to work, like, I don't give him too much stuff. I want him to do one thing and one thing very well. And more than likely, that will get him out of pain. <clears throat> he doesn't really want to become athletically competent, usually. If I have an athlete come in, yeah, I will. You start following it up, and you get a lot more deep into the techniques of being able to uh, reciprocate muscles and muscle patterns and stuff like that. But man, I try to keep everything as simple as I can for people because um, you could have the coolest exercise in the world and you could be correct in saying that it is the best exercise. But if people don't have the time to do it or it's just weird, they won't do it. Well, then it's worthless. I don't care if you're actually correct in what you say. A lot of what we do is psychology. A lot of it is being um, empathetic to the patient situation. So I don't, as weird as it sounds, like. I don't get, I don't get super weird in this stuff unless I really need to, uh, and then I'm very hesitant to do that uh, unless it's a very complex case. Yeah, we we've talked about this a little bit about how, <clears throat> like, a good exercise is as good as it is compliant. You know right. what I mean? Like, like <clears throat> you can give the weirdest twelve step thing, and it might be precisely what they need based on their testing, based on their history, and if they don't do it, it doesn't matter. You know, you can, water is good. If you don't drink it, you're dehydrated. You know? Well, and yeah. And that's so, sometimes I, I, I see doctors, you know, they'll read the, they'll read so much stuff and the papers and the way to test an exercise through EMG studies and all this stuff. Like you could be correct. That could be the one exercise that definitely nails the glute need in just the right way. People hate it. So what are you doing it for? Like, it, and I don't care if people hate it, but it's like they actually just won't do it. And they, sometimes if the patient doesn't feel like something is effective, they won't do it. So I, I, I sometimes give things that they don't even really need, but man, they love it because it makes them feel something and it gives them a positive encouragement that they're getting better. It's like sometimes patients like pain or they like an exercise that's very hard to do. Like they're like, man, I really feel it. Like, you definitely got it. And I'm like, you don't even need that, but whatever. I'm glad you like it. And I'm glad you're motivated and it will make you better in general, but we probably could have got away without it. But man, I just, I want them to be psychologically bought in to that they're getting better and they can feel a difference. And we're making a true anatomical impact on their body, not a, a magic show or a temporary or, you know, everything's temporary, but you know, as long as we can make it fix. Is there a lot of emphasis that you have on, you know, time, time under tension, time to make these changes? Like, how do you work that, like, with the patient, you know? Because there's something like the FRS, you know, the FR guys, mm -hmm. Spina. I mean, it's really hard to refute anything they do. But, but if you look at anybody who follows their stuff, they are all happen to be 5'8", former gymnasts that really appreciate doing shoulder cars with, you know, uh, bowling pins in their hands. And I love that stuff, but you can't always do that with patients. But then the, the truth, the, the, the very basic truth of what they do is that to, to make a real change takes time, Correct. you know, and, and do you have to work that in with patient education or 
is it kind of a fine, you kind of deal with patients as they come in, you can kind of feed off of their, their personality? No, I don't. I don't. I mean, I tell them like, this is my, my first conversation with a patient is, you know, or my first visit with a patient is let's chat and let's have a really long chat because you're here today because you've seen everybody else. And so we're going to get all these myths that you think I'm going to fix this for you. No, this is going to be you. This is, I'm your guide on this path, right? Uh, I, I can make you the hero, but you got to take this up and you have to do this yourself. Um, the time under tension stuff is very real. And what's odd is I, I'm, I'm mentoring quite a few doctors right now in my new role, and they're very timid to do that, to have that conversation. And it's surprising to me. Um, and I don't know if it's their mentality of like they feel as a doctor that they should be the one to fix somebody uh, and that it should be quick. And you just tell them like, that's crazy. Like, there's no way that you're this person, you're going to go in and fix this or push on this and their 20 year long back pain is going to go away for forever. Like there are so many things set into play now that a lot of the things that I do, you know, I love to just give people some exercises and say, I'll see you in a month. And if they come back and they've gotten all of them and they're better, they're like, all right, sweet, we'll go to phase two. Uh, but at some, you know, a lot of patients would contact me and they say, man, I'm still really bad at that exercise. I'm like, okay, then give it another month. I don't care. Whatever. Mm -hmm. I'll be here with you till the end. Uh, but you need to put in the work. And sometimes that work, I mean, I had a few patients, uh, one in Bali, actually, when you were there, um, Bobby, it took him three months of every day doing some hip extension stuff like a beast and he would sweat and cry and everything. And it took him a solid three months. He did it two to three times a day, but his mm. system was so wound up. Uh, and he actually had some other weird stuff like jaw problems and all this other stuff. But, you know, at the beginning I was like, let's just get the basics. And it just took him forever. So I just gave him the time. Like, I don't need to see you again. What am I going to do? Like at, at the beginning of my career, I used to smash on a bunch of stuff thinking that I would speed it up and I just smashed on people. <laughs> yeah. So you know the you know the Carla Stecco books, right? Did Man, you ever take I, the class? No, but oh. but the textbook. So when I'm when you go through those things, I'm thinking, look at all this stuff. Look at this tissue. You know what I mean? And this is they did a good job in those pictures because it's more like fresh cadavers, fresh tissue. It's not like the one that we had in Cairo school, very desiccated and already you know, pre-cut and everything. But I just kept thinking like, okay, I know that they have cells in there and they respond. We have Bacinian corpuscles. We have all these things that respond to these things, but look at that tissue. That stuff is, that is mechanotransduction is the answer yeah. to this stuff. There's no way it responds to temporary or even as hard as I can push on somebody. Yeah, that tissue is, it, it, it just, somebody needs to go look at that stuff if you've never seen oh. what I'm talking about, yeah. Yeah, the, the fuzz speech stuff, even on YouTube, I mean, it's still old. That's still one of my favorites. Like you, when you really see that stuff, it's, it's amazing to see, see and understand how much adaptation your body can, can do, uh, but then how long it takes afterwards. Like, um, you know, Coach Summer, I remember listening to him years ago and him talk about, oh, you want to be a gymnast? Sweet, I'll see you in five years. And then mm -hmm. you'll be at the basic level. And you realize like, almost everything that they do isn't about the power and the strength. Like they had to build up tissue quality in order to take that load. And that's an amazingly hard road. Um, and that's your job as a doctor is to be their guide on that road. So yeah, I mean, totally. So, I mean, I think classes work, but with, with all these different, like the mechanoreceptors, all the tissue stuff, this kind of goes back to why you're doing that hip extension immediately because there are so many factors and you just want to cipher or filter them through like a very specific tunnel. And one of those tunnels you've basically found to, to, to be productive is that hip extension tunnel or, you know, like ASCII's the dorsiflexion thoracic rotation. But I mean, that hip being in the middle of your body, you got Correct. all that stuff going on you at least need to funnel through that because you're seeing so many different factors and you're trying to catch something and work some magic. Yeah. Right. So like these, well, that was an interesting thing. You're talking about all these doctors you're kind of mentoring and, 
and how they want it. From what I hear, they want to do magic every time. They kind of want to be the superhero. But it's almost like super superhero to be like, I'm not the superhero. Yep. I'm going to show you how to be this. Like it takes, it takes a real superhero to lay down. I don't know what the, the phrase, the phrase is, but I like, can, I, can, I can tell you like, you're, you're, you're right though. Like philosophically, I think it is quite weird. The best doctor does the least. I don't need to be your hero, right? I need to, I need to make you the hero of this journey. I, I don't, I mean, I listen to a lot of things outside of clinical stuff now, but, um, there's a guy and he talks about how there's this fundamental stuff or the hero journey is a very fundamental journey that we always hear about. It's, it's in every movie that we see the lion King, whatever, but you know, letting that patient be their own hero uh, is a very big deal. And you stepping back and not having to be the hero makes you more of the hero. And it really, it will, I, I mean, to all the new doctors out there, the one thing I can say is it will make your practice grow so much faster if you can kind of do that a little bit and step back and make some big changes on patients um, because people you're going to be the first time for somebody that that you're going to make them make a change and everybody else has tried to do it for them and um, I, I know you're now the weird guy I mean I you know me and John were always the weird guy, but you're the you're the odd clinician that isn't trying to do everything for them you're trying to teach them to not have to come back to you. And when the more, I don't want to say push people away, but the more that you're trying to let them be on their own, the more they want it, they're drawn to you in some sort of odd co cosmic karma way, you know? No, there Especially is if, you can, if you can ask them that question too of who else have you seen and what have they tried, right? And they usually will give you this rap sheet of, of you know, although they did needles and massage, and I've been to this physio and this physical therapist, and I went to you know twenty five chiro appointments, and that's a great entry to do exactly what you were saying, right? Like, listen, if the passive stuff, if if the magic in our hands was there, it would have worked by now. So yeah. you know, you can shift the impetus for change to be on them, like just like you laid out. I agree, it's awesome. I love I love the uh, lovely philosophical stuff, but let's get a tiny bit more technical back to this wall stretch tiny bit to start off with a tiny bit uh when you're talking about this couch stretch the k-star one where you're kind of locking them up in the knee flexion the the toe is kind of uh plantar flex pointed up we're locking those joints up along that line what i hear uh, and i just want to get your opinion on it is and you said it it was pretty subtle but you wanted to get a pelvis that moved on a femur and so what i hear when a femur that moved on a pelvis exactly that's what you said i want to quote you right um <laughs> there's other times that i want a pelvis to move on a femur but yeah no i i agree i agree so in this situation when you put the knee locked back into a corner that femur is stuck correct and so then they're in like a, a kneeling position right so if we can just all imagine this in podcast land one knee is jammed back into the corner, the heel is up to the butt, the other leg is in the front, and then they're slowly bringing what looks like their torso upright. So like, what is that, you were talking pelvis, femur, femur, pelvis. Hmm. What is the, what are the kind of first steps into that mechanism that you're kind of looking for? And, and yeah, correct me, when I said pelvis, femur, femur, pelvis, those distinctions are very important, I think, in your world. What, what is that one sp more spe a little more specifically doing? And, and shin on wall? Is it shin on wall always? Okay. Always. Like, for me, it was always, um, it, you know, it's weird that you say that. There are so many patients that when they put their shin on the wall, like what you talked about earlier, their hamstring will cramp up immediately. And, they're not, and all they did was kind of split the femurs, right, or split the pelvis into a walking stance. And the first time their, their hamstring pops on, um, and there's a lot of patients that they can't even get the dorsiflexion in their foot. So they're starting on this, uh, the, this kinetic chain all the way up. Um, and I, I think I actually am going off topic a little bit, but it's, fine. it's such an interesting thing to me that early on in practice and people, I became so very um, specific about this exercise because when I watched people cheat it, just a little bit it was so weird what would happen there was some people that would put a box against the wall because they were like oh well my ankle 
uh, doesn't move that well, and they would get hip extension. But when you tried to make the ankle go into dorsiflexion, they lost all their hip extension. And I just kept looking at all this stuff, and I'm like, man, it's it just you have to make sure that everything along the kinetic chain is viable or it, you know, it allows for what, you know, some people call that kind of torque dump or that movement dump or it's like, oh, yeah, I got extension through this part of the system and it neurologically allowed me to get extension or else it's just, or I don't think I said that correctly, but you know, you, you, you didn't lock the system up correctly and it cheated neurologically and things were allowed to turn on uh, and you got a, false positive or false negative into the system. Um, so th when you asked about that specifics of a femur moving on a pelvis, once I've locked the knee and the ankle into uh, flexion, I know that the only way that they can get true extension is to bring the pelvis up more. So the shin's against the wall, the femur is now locked. The other foot comes forward so it starts to bring that pelvis and twist it around and try to get it into extension because whatever you do to one side of the pelvis, the other side of the pelvis is doing something opposite. So I know that if I'm going into hip flexion on the on one side, the other one is trying to get into hip extension. And then you start to see if somebody really can keep midline hip extension and not cheat with those angulations like you were talking about earlier, uh, Bobby, with the Thomas test. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's, again, what you said is close to the FR saying of articular independence before you can have articular interdependence, right? Correct. And I think you said dorsiflexion, but didn't you say, didn't you mean plantar flexion? Like if no. you, yeah, yeah. right, right, because by putting it on a box, they get some dorsiflexion, and then all Correct. of a sudden, they get their hip extension. Correct. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Okay. No, no, just, yeah. just clarifying, because people it's are early. listening. Yeah. It's real early. It's fine. Well, and I, I keep forgetting that not everybody can see this, and I'm a very big picture person. So in my head, most of, I, I, I think I don't talk very well because most of how I see the world is in pictures. And so it's trying to describe that picture. I always get words mixed up, and there's just a lot of stuff going on in there. It's we fine. do it too. We do it yeah. too. You're doing good. All, all dang day. I mean, you had to correct me earlier. It's fine. Um, so like, okay, so they're spending some time in this tension. Uh, they're trying to get hip extension. There's a little bit of a passive kind of cheat of hip flexion on the opposite side. How often, this, will this go, kind of go back to your basic kind of testing and stuff? How often um, is that test the same on both sides? Like how, how often do you see someone who's like, oh, I can do this on the left and on the right very quickly. Do you, do you notice? I mean, probably like that's, that's like my, my 10 to 20%. And usually I'm very worried if they can, if they come in with a problem and they can do that test and they're like, oh yeah, I don't feel anything. I just go, shit, this is going to be a rough case because they're a Gumby, right? Like, you have an issue, but you don't have this issue. Like I'm, I'm excited when I see somebody bad at this stuff because I'm like, man, I don't have to do other stuff. I can start at the beginning. Um, I mean, John, you know me, like I, I split the world between Gumby's and stiff people. Right. And I would much, it's so much easier to treat a stiff person than it is a Gumby. Um, it's, you know, the bane of my clinical existence was my hypermobile people for many years until I got a, a good mental grasp of how to um, start from the end to integrate stuff, which is difficult. You, you mentioned the ankle could be a restriction for getting this stuff to work all as a team. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, John and I often use the phrase like rate limiting step, something that prevents everything else from yep. moving forward. And like, I'm thinking something like adductor tightness. I mean, is there anything like that where, this test doesn't get you into hip extension because there's something prior to that that you got to move into. Do you, do you feel like abduction and because of adductor issues is a limiter or prevents you to, to, to go straight to hip extension? Does that make sense? Or does the hip, by gaining the hip extension, you clear out a lot of the adductor issues? No, I think that's just the next step. You know, like I don't think mm -hmm. you, you, I think it's just the one that I go to. It's the, how would I put that? It's my biggest lever, right, that I can pull at the very beginning. And then and I, I think sometimes it clears up a lot of pain. It doesn't clear up all the problems, 
but a lot of times you don't need the person, you know, in general population, I don't need them to be perfect. I need them to be under threshold at a comfortable place. And so, you know, if, how would I, I always ask the patient, like, what's your goal? And normally it's like, I just want to be out of pain. So, so I give them that point where I know that they're out of pain, they're off the cliff, they walk back a mile and they're going to be in a safe place. I don't know that it clears up a lot of adductor um, or different planes of motion. I just know that if you do get some hip extension into that plane, that they feel better because now they have a, a normal or semi-normal gait. They may, they, they may not be able to um, alternate and reciprocate, but at least they can move forward in space. So that I, I don't uh, disagree with you, um, but also I don't, um, I guess that's just my next one. Like, I see what happens. I got it. Yeah. It's kind of that idea of starting a bit sagittal before you move into frontal or transverse, right? It's similar to that idea. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you guys talk about this a lot. Like in your sports specific, your sports people, you you need a lot more of those other planes of motion. But general population, they they just need a lot of sagittal plane. Like that's what they're okay in. Um, and then if they want to put a lot of load, though, you're definitely going to get into those other planes of motion, um, frontal rotation, transverse, all that stuff. I mean, I think that that the basic thing, especially we're going back to the very beginning with the new doctors again, and as a new doctor, I just I can only speak for myself. My mentality was I need to clear out and fix these orthopedic orthopedic uh, range of motion things, and then the person will be better. If they have a, a negative Thomas test, life is good, and that's not the case. That's, no. that's just not the, like you're not fixing orthopedic tests. You are the, your primary goal is kind of what where where you're going with this, Steve is where you're like, this person wants to get out of pain. And I figured this thing needs to get them out of pain, even though in my mind, I'm like, okay, so that uh, capsule needs to rotate and hip flexor needs to inhibit that anterior quad needs to calm down and the posterior spine needs to inhibit, get them out of pain. Mm -hmm. It was the thing that's going to get them out of pain. And this is what you're saying, going back to how do you grow your practice quicker, talking to patients and getting on their level. They so, could care less if their femur has 15 degrees of extension and how that happens. They want to walk down the block, uh, you know, and get out of their house during this coronavirus season. Like they just want to do that without pain. And so what I'm hearing as a transition from like new doctor getting out of the textbook and kind of into your patient's head, it is trying to find those and stick to those goals and stick, right. make yours kind of secondary. Fair? Yeah, yo, for sure. I, I think the way that I have um, articulated it now over the last year or so to doctors is your first job on the patient's first visit is to clear up any psychological barriers that they have to do this. So their biggest thing that they want to know is, is this really big and scary, right? Because they think they have cancer when they come in. Like, what, no matter what they have, it's the biggest deal in the world. And you've been in practice for any amount of time. You've always heard every patient say, am I the worst case you've ever seen? No, you're not the damn worst case you've ever seen. But they, they want to know that. So your job as a doctor is to rule out all the big stuff. Make sure it's that. Have a bias or a, a leaning towards that it's probably not a zebra. So don't look for zebras everywhere, right? This is probably a normal case. Make sure that it's nothing we need to kind of refer out to, uh, and then start on some of these basic things and, and let them get that and ask them what their goal is. Um, I find it's very interesting that doctors don't ask patients what their goal is, that the doctor has a goal and they're trying to put that goal onto the patient and the patient could care less what your goal is. Ask them what theirs is. And, um, you know, this is basic stuff, but how you build your practice is to give people what they want. I, we've had this conversation, John, where it's like, this is a service oriented business. No matter what it is, you can feel like you're very smart and cool, but if the patient comes in and they want uh, their goal, your job is to get them their goal and evaluate what that is. And maybe the conversation has to be that I can't give you that goal. And there's been a lot of patients where I tell them, you're in the wrong place. I can't give you that. So go find the person that is, I'll, I'll refer you to whoever it is. So uh, growing that practice, if, if, if I can give advice to new doctors going out, Start there, start simple, ask the patient what it is that they want, um, and then go looking for these or, or trying to go look for these big movement things that will clear out a lot. Um, we talked about that before. Like, I mean, I know you kind of, you know, well, you were a bartender, but also helped open some bars at a higher level in that industry for a long time. 
I just waited tables and stuff. But I remember this lawyer telling me, he's like, I mean, I'm a lawyer. I'm a, I'm in the fancy service industry. And I was like, damn it. Me too. And yeah. I've always kind of thought that like, and then relating it back to that, like, look, okay. If someone comes into your bar and they're like, Ooh, um, so I just want a Bud Light. And you're like, oh, 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 wait a second. I've got this thing called an old fashioned. Now what I do with it is, oh, and hold on, let me get an orange peel and it'll be 15 minutes. They're like, I want a Bud Light, man. Yep. And, and you lost that patient. They're not coming back to your bar. You know what I mean? Uh, if you can tell them, you're like, okay, you want a Bud Light? Let's really talk about it. Okay. You know, and kind of dive in. Maybe we end up with a Miller Light. Maybe we get them to an IPA. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, it's way that that's, I think that's what doctors do. They're legit. Like, let me show you what a Manhattan is. And let me walk you through all the steps of Manhattan. The patient's like, Oh, I could care less. Give me a Bud Light, <laughs> you know? And sometimes you need to help the patient learn to articulate what it is specifically that art, but that's your whole conversation in the beginning is, is reorienting that position of service into the, those doctors, it seems. Yeah, I mean, for sure. I, that's the that's a, and that's a great analogy. You're trying to give them more than what they want, right? They want something, and and you'd be surprised what they'll do to get that goal. They'll go through pain. They'll go through whatever it is. Uh, they'll do your dumb, weird exercises. They really will. Like if you make them believe it, but you better back it up, and they better get that goal in the end. Uh, and so, just giving them that will grow your practice because, you know, they leave and they're happy with what they have. Word. Let's get back to some stupid technical stuff now. Uh, philosophy. Uh, okay, so we were talking about, let's go back to this hip flexor couch stretch. Everything's locked up. And we were talking a little bit about bony stuff. Let's talk about some soft tissue stuff. Because we did this deco thing, there's a bunch of soft tissue. But within this test, people will say like, and I've heard it too, because I, I love to give people this, this wall stretch quite often. Oh, my ankle hurts. I can't really do it because my ankle hurts. And I'm like, sit there, <laughs> do it. But uh people will be like well i don't feel it in my hip flexor where where okay so yeah, yeah i know your response already <laughs> <laughs> what is uh, what for people that didn't see steve just shrugged and i was like okay fine uh <laughs> what is the soft what soft tissues are you looking for when you when when we're doing this hip flexor wall stretch whatever you want to call it? what soft tissues are you thinking in your head um, oddly, I'm not, I don't care where you feel it. I don't like, I, I want to know if you're good at it or bad at it. Uh, because I don't care where you feel it. If you feel it there, that's where you need to feel it. That's where your limitation rate is, right? If you feel it in your ankle, sweet, you need to get your ankle better. And if you feel it in your knee, sweet, you need to get your knee better because that's something pulling on your knee. Uh, if you feel it in the bottom of your quad, sweet. Uh, I've always described it as a cannonball. I'm just shooting one humongous cannonball through the system and it's going to blow out whatever it needs to. And after we kind of do that, let the, let the, the, the settle, you know, let everything settle. And then we see what we have left. Like, um, you know, that, that's my analogy that I go to. I, I'm going to shoot the biggest elephant in the room first, see how many elephants are left, go to the next biggest elephant. Uh, because that's what you have to do with complex cases. Uh, too many times, if you're, if you're a new doctor, complex cases, or complex movement patterns are so much to handle uh, cortically, you know, like in your, you see so many things and like, where do you start? And you start with one step forward. You start with hip extension right there and you try to get it and you see what's happening. Um, punch the guy, the biggest guy in the room first and see if this, if this keeps going on. Um, and I do think that that's where a lot of new doctors make a mistake is that everything is complex. And you're right, I may oversimplify all of this treatment by just doing the same thing with everybody. But that's the point is I'm trying to simplify something that is very, very complex in nature and break it down into something that we can start to treat with today and you can make an impact on. It seems like it's very self-empowering too in a way, right? Because I was thinking I'm gonna ask you a question about what's your long-term goal with these patients. Let's say like the guy in Bali who three months of hard, hard work and then he's finally better he's going to ask you this question, which is, do I have to do this for the rest of my life? And I feel like you've already set them up to understand the answer. The answer is, can you pass this test or not? And if, there, if you see a connection between them, right, like I can now do the wall stretch quite well, 
my pain disappears or my function of whatever comes back. That's self-empowering, right? It's, it's, they understand their own issue now. They don't need yep. to understand degrees of IR or, or pelvis on femur, femur on pelvis. They just yep. need to know if I do, if I have this, I, I feel this, right? And you can elaborate, but I'm, I was kind of going to ask and I'm like, I think pretty sure this is your answer. Yeah, you, you're definitely right. Like I, I'm, I, I love these things because you're right. Like a pass fail test to me, a patient feels it. They don't mm. care why, but they make the correlation in their head. Like what John asked earlier, how often do you see someone who can do this on both sides equally? Um, not often, especially if they're a, a, someone who has chronic pain on one side of the body. Um, and to, you know, to, you know, I think one of the emphasis you guys always want to talk about is for new doctors. The second step after I kind of get through all of this, um, you know, is this a big and scary problem uh, is, can you tell this patient a story that makes sense to them? It may not be exactly true biomechanically what's going on, but if that story makes sense to them, then they're more bought into doing what you have to say. And so, you know, you do a wall stretch and this person has chronic knee pain, chronic ankle pain and chronic hip pain all on the right side. And then you ask them, it's really weird why it's on the right side, right? And they go, yeah, it is kind of weird. How come I don't have left-sided problems? They get into that stretch and that one side is really bad. They go, oh man, maybe that has something to do with me always having these right-sided. I thought God hated my right side and that's why I had all these problems. And you go, no, you just had this imbalance for a long time. And those stories can become very powerful um, because they make them in their own head. You don't even have to be this fancy doctor and tell them about IR and the way hips rotate and a femur on a pelvis. All they know is they sucked at one thing on one side and the other side was good. More than likely that has something to do with the why, reason why they're in your clinic. I feel like this also does a really good job of, and, and, and we'll probably see the pattern here on this episode, but like getting ahead of questions you always get in, in clinic. Yeah. Like, so one of the other questions that I always get in clinic, um, and less so uh, recently, but especially as a new doctor is, um, why isn't this getting better? How will I know that this is better? Um, you know, or I kind of feel better. Uh, am I better? And they're kind of looking to you. They're, they're, you're, they're looking to, for some gauge to be like, ha, I think I'm better, but I don't know. But I feel like also this test, this exercise, well, at first my ankle sucked. Well, and I did it a couple more days and then my knee started to suck, but now my knee doesn't suck. D do you feel like this test also gets ahead of that? Like, how will I know I'm better question or am I getting better? Yeah, I, I use it as that kind of benchmark where patients would come in and they go, you know, my, my back still hurts and it's been two weeks. And I go, oh, how's that stretch going? Oh, I still suck at it. I go, oh, okay. Well, well, you just, you literally just gave me your answer. Like until you can do that in a passing sense, you should know this was the reason why you kind of have pain. This is probably the thing that you're going to be looking for yourself to say, once this yeah. is better, I should be kind of expecting some relief in some of my symptoms, maybe not all of them because it's complex, but you know, like you got better at a big movement pattern, probably that's going to unlock some things and that's when you should be experiencing some decrease in the overall symptomatology. Yeah. And if that does increase, right. The, it's like the baton goes back to you at that point. Correct. Right. And I, that I kind of want to ask a little more advanced question now. And I think yep. if we can bring the shoulder in just a little bit, because I feel like it's an, it's a tougher one. There's so many influences on the shoulder. Yep. And if we think about this, I, I've, I've had, I've spent many hours thinking about this discrepancy between something like cars, controlled articular rotations of trying to increase a joint's uh, ability, so to speak, and position. You know, this yeah. is more of the DNS PRI guys talking about the importance of position. Like, you know, I always remember those guys say like, unless that neck is somewhere neutral, don't touch that neck, right? We, we know this line. And like with the shoulder, for like question number one would be, do you have a parallel to the shoulder like you do for the hip? You have the hip extension against the wall. Do you have a sagittal go-to for the shoulder? And then the second question is more that advanced, that advanced question of shoulders get stuck in positions, man, like either just pec minors that have been holding a shoulder, a shoulder blade in a position for a decade, 
And the, the, the discrepancy side to side of a shoulder blade or a glenohumeral humeral joint can be just intense in my experience, side to side. Mm-hmm. I mean, so do you, do you still attack it basically? And then like, let's say they, like my worry is you go after something like shoulder flexion, but they're in such a poor position that you either can't get out of that position, no matter how much flexion you're working on, or you create a secondary issue of laxity or something in a position that's not even good. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, what's weird is I think shoulder is the most complex and yet at the same time, the most simple to sometimes attack if it's not a, um, you know, a high level athlete, Hmm. You know, a lot of the same things apply like it does in the hip for general populations. They need very particular ranges of motion. I have a few exercises that I always do with shoulders too that would that in my mind are the clinical equivalent to a wall stretch for a shoulder, right? Because when you're in my mind, when you're talking about a shoulder, you're really talking ribs. And this gets into much more of that deep conversation of this is why shoulders really are complex, because ribs are weird, man. And you get into that deep dive is not something I encourage new practitioners to get into unless they have someone either guiding them or they have something to like fall back on for treatment because you start getting into weird stuff. Uh, and in a lot of times patients, you'll lose them because you're trying all these weird different things. I use a lot of gymnastic style um, uh, for my, you know, shoulder behind the back, you know, um, just having a broomstick and being able to get into that, um, is it shoulder? And I'm blanking out extension. right now. It's shoulder. Extension. Shoulder extension. Yeah. I'm like, um, cause like you stall, kept... stall bar stuff. So I, I know you're a big fan of the stall bars. Yeah. Um, I wish that everybody had a stall bar cause it just makes life easier, you know? Um, but I do, I just want a lot of shoulder extension and I want to know that you can, um, you know, bring both arms pretty close together behind your back and then start to differentiate the um the scapula and the, um, the humerus away from the rib cage and just being able to separate those so that they're not articulating together what we talked about before differentiation of those kind of things and then i use a, a very um something i stole from a pitching coach i think it was years ago uh, but in the transverse plane uh being able to put the body into a quadruped position and then being able to have them slowly go up against a wall so that they're, yeah, correct. So that they are rotating against a pelvis that is fixed. Mm. So, so then, I, then I know where your problem is coming from. Do you really have, and everybody has it, you know, you, do you really have just an upper quadrant problem or do you have an upper quadrant problem with a lower quadrant compensation? Well, you just need to treat both of them almost at the exact same time because that rib cage is the pelvis, right? Like it's having all of that force moving through it. Um, those are, I, I don't know if that's a, I don't know if I answered your question or just talked in a circle. That's, no, it was good. And the secondary question was a little bit more about that worry about position. Um, but I also have a follow up, which would be why do I care about getting shoulder extension in a patient that has a problem with flexion? Just, just want you to answer that one. You're like, why do you go after extension when the problem is, ah, it hurts when I do pull ups, hurts when I do overhead squat at CrossFit? It's all flexion problems. I don't. Yeah, you know, I don't know if I can articulate it's a double level. Uh, well, it is. It's true. It's like it's almost the same as you know in the hip. Like, why do you get hip extension first? Well, it's like, well, besides being one tissue in the front that you may be Im- impinging on as you go into flexion and through there, and you're just to me, in my mind, and I, and I don't even know if I actually quite understand what you, you're not, I don't know if I actually have the answer to your question, but as I'm thinking through it and talking, um, you know, I, I'm trying to free the joint up in multiple ranges of motion so that I can increase the variability. Because it sounds like if you're only getting pain in one range of motion, then that's the one that you're limited in and you have no other variability to go anywhere else, right? So, there's a lot of tissues and a lot of structures in the front of your rib cage that you want to loosen up in extension so that as you go through flexion, those things can clear so that the shoulder can get into a better position. And then also you're just trying to get the ribs to be able to move. And you're, I'm, I'm, yeah, that's good. 
Yes, <laughs> ding, good, ding. Man. I'm I'm assuming you want that rib cage down when they go into hip extension or sorry, shoulder extension. Correct. And I want and I yes, and I want the subclavius and all of the pecs to be able to inhibit to allow the ribs to come down because if they're just coming up with the shoulder, then everything is moving together. So I want to make sure that those things are cleared so that I can go into those other positions and the humerus can articulate on a scapula that's on a better plane of motion on the back of the ribs, right? Because mm. everything's happening at once. And so I'm, I mean, I guess maybe for, in my mind as a new doctor to explain it, um, clear out everything as long as you're not creating a pathology or a hyperlaxity somewhere. I think the for when I think about what I'm going to translate some Steve because that's one of my few things in life that I can do. <laughs> just, just, we've known each other for a very long time, and half I, of the stuff that comes out of my mouth I don't even understand. So if you can translate, that'd be great. I invited uh, ten people to my wedding, and my wife invited ten people. Steve and his wife are one of the ten people yeah. I invited to my wedding, so I can translate what. So what. We were talking about in the very beginning, you asked him, we were talking about getting the ribs in a good place so you don't get the humerus to torque into a weird position. You don't rip a, a, a ligament, you don't rip one of those specific rotator cuff. So if you get the base right first, and that's kind of what he's talking about, getting those ribs back. In terms of extension, one of the first things in terms of PRI is getting those ribs down and back. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard for people to isolate, and this is why it gets technical for new doctors, to by themselves, don't move anything and just pull your ribs down and back. That is not like, like, no, it's really hard to have that awareness unless you're like a dancer or some kind of gymnast or Cirque du Soleil. You don't have that differentiation between your prime movers and like, say, your torso. So with like a shoulder extension, like the broomstick, or I posted an exercise that was a core one where I put my arms way back and I was lifting my feet up. Uh, putting the arms back into extension will pull those ribs down and back. And you're also get some of that opening up of the soft tissue in the front. But if you can kind of hold your arms back there, you'll see patients start to freak out the stall bar too. They'll just, they can't really breathe with mm. their arms back there. Same thing goes with what you were talking about. The guy with the hip flexor, he would cry and he couldn't breathe like that whole thing. Can you just, can your body chill out there? So sometimes going into uh, uh, humoral, your arms extending will also then flex those ribs down in a natural way to set that base. Because so with the arms going overhead, the flexion problem, those ribs are also now in an extended problem, right? They're overextended. You see the rib flare is up too much. And so technically we want to start to get those ribs to flex down and get a better base so that the arm can go flex up on its own. And I think arm extension pulls those ribs down into that flexed position more comfortably and easily then a lot there are fun rib, rib techniques to do but sometimes it's the same thing is just put that arm back and try to breathe there for a little while um, right, now yeah. i want to hear Bobby's. this is all three of us saying the same thing in a totally different way <laughs> yes, <Bobby. laughs> exactly well i have What's a comment your answer, bobby i have a comment on it which is oh. it was very counterintuitive for me this idea initially of ribs, rib IR or ribs going down, having something to do with my ability to go overhead with an arm, because it seems way more intuitive that ribs go up as scapulas go up as humeruses go up. Right. But I noticed, I mean, I've worked with some high level CrossFitters, ones that get paid good money. And you see these x-rays of zero, you know, kyphosis in the thorax and actually a reversed cervical curve and maybe a high amount of tension or headache issues associated with their ability to do their sport. And I would say they're, those are usually the, one of the best ones, but they usually don't win. They're like very, very good. They work really hard, but they need a lot of work just to calm down. It seems like they have so much tension. These are more the adapted to the full extension. You know, this, everything is extended. Everything is ER everything is, you know, those ribs go up as the head goes forward as the shoulder blade. So they've, they've built this ability to do amazing things like one armed, heavy overhead walking lunges, like you have to do in the, the last day of the CrossFit games. But I'm worried more about those people 10 years after they're done with CrossFit. And now they're getting kind of stuck in these positions. And 
uh, and you can see a lot of pathology so to, you know associated over time to things like labral tears or rotator cuff tears and you know when we test them on the table things that we know they I mean they can't go ribs down with uh, especially without a whole bunch of stuff moving as you push that <laughs> those ribs down all the head looks up like 60 degrees as you push their ribs down you know i mean this is just what i was thinking as i'm listening to you guys explain uh, but it was very counterintuitive for me to this idea of getting you know posterior expansion which would increase the ability to have a good shoulder it is weird i mean and i i, I find the same thing when you start working with really high level people I think it's very interesting to see either how uh, how the naturals are natural. Like when you see somebody that doesn't have any problems, and then you do tests with them, and they're like, "Man, they have all these ra these ranges of motion. No wonder they don't need to come and see me, and no wonder they have ten years in the league." You know, when you start seeing professional athletes, and then you see this other person who works really hard, but man, they are fighting everything. And you know, and and I've had some discussions with parents, and I go. No, your son is not going to be, I mean, maybe he will be, maybe he'll, you know, maybe I, I'm reading this wrong, but he's going to be fighting his genetics or his natural ability his whole life to try to compete at this high level because his system is 15 degrees off of center. And to try to get it back to that zero neutral place is really hard. And that's going to eventually wear it down like, a, like he's running at full, full octane. And these other guys, you know, I think my expression is always like, they just wake up in the morning and they, they take a poop, wipe their butt, and they just go kill it because they're just genetically amazing. And you just think, wow, man, like that's impressive, you know, especially at the CrossFit Games when you really see that the, the level of the top five is actually so much more astounding than the rest. They're just freaks. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I was trying to think of, uh, I totally lost my train of thought, but I wanted to keep going with the CrossFit guys. Um, Oh, like this idea of, like you said, they like they better win the games before they break some of them, right? Like, you, but hopefully they can do it before things break. And you got the people like Froning and uh, now Fraser and people like Tia Toomey. Like, yeah. you put them on the table and they just, like, you guarantee they can just put stuff down, lift, you know, arms go up, ribs go in, they can twist, they can turn. And it, it's, it's always when I've worked with CrossFitters especially, I, I bring up those people on purpose to say, yeah it's their efficiency. They never, they, they don't, okay, never, but they hardly get any serious injuries. That's why you can win year after year after year. And they can just, you know, just, it's like throning, climbing back at, at, the, at the end of every wad, just catches everybody because he never breaks down. And you know, you, you know, those are those lucky people, you put them on the table and stuff just moves wonderfully. And if something freakish happens, yeah, they recover really fast. <laughs> They're the ones back after four months on an ACL tear. And I think, again, for these new doctors, that is such a small population of human beings on this earth, let alone people that are going to come into your clinic. This goes back to the beginning. Keep it simple, stupid. Like, your Tia Toomey's are not ac like accidentally, the Matt Frazier's are not just going to wind up in your clinic. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, the vast majority of people, you don't have to overthink it and get really technical with. You can go back to this earlier stuff. Even, even if they're super high level, it's amazing to me to watch how many so incredibly gifted athletes suck at so much stuff that's very basic. And I go, yep, you're going to be a, you're going to be rocking for only a little bit longer though if you don't make this better because over time, your you running red line is not going to work out. And you see those people like you said, Rich Froning and them like CrossFit is that most amazing sport that just puts you to a, it's the volume that you go through that really test the neuro system and its ability to wind back down and breathe in a weird, uncomfortable position like you were talking about, John, and those things. And it's amazing even the CrossFitters that I work with that are just like, they, they get excited about CrossFit and how much better that they get with a little bit of mobility, just a little bit. <laughs> All right, well, one last topic. I don't wanna keep you forever. I know you got two, uh, two boys uh ready for rampage hour at any given time I, i'm having a good time this is like this is the the most clinical like thought-provoking stuff i've had in a while so I, they, I i'm glad we could give that to you look it's a service it's a service industry, service that industry. In. that's what i think that's the <laughs> takeaway here okay so this is a topic i've been wanting to talk about with bobby a little bit 
uh, and I know that we go down a rabbit hole. If I'm ever going to get sent something on Instagram by Dr. Offenberger, it's going to be some crazy gymnastic stretchy stuff. Okay. And so I love, so go, go back to your comment about the stall bar, Bobby, like that's some gymnastic stuff going back to your comment about the adductors. I feel like, you know, we'll take some of these gymnastic stuff and kind of break it down to a more simplified place. Let's my shoulder extension. That's a gymnastic ab exercise, but I make it a little bit more simple for my patients. Just getting into extension. Um, there are some of these crazy things we see on uh, Instagram. Um, what draws you to some of these? Like, I know that you've been trying to like work on your split squat or whatever, or your your straight squat. What are what are you trying to work on now in terms of like your crazy mobility? You talking to me or Bobby? I'm talking. To, I'm talking to Steve. I'm talking to you. Oh. Sorry. Yeah, and, and Steve, maybe you can give that. I mean, I remember your story about the stall bars and doing just like a straight legged, like a V up, you know, with, uh, yeah. with your core mm -hmm. and how when you started, I don't know what your starting was and how bad you felt compared to what, <laughs> what, it, what it did for you. So I just remember that story and I bet people would like to hear and, it. And these are some, okay, just very quickly before we get into this, these are some side fun things that were, this is, this is way less clinical. This is like stretching to the max, getting nerdy time. So like, <laughs> With, yeah, like experimenting with your own body. This is something you brought up, Bobby. You're like, look, if you can't fix it on, this is Bobby's theory. If you yeah. can't fix it on yourself, you can't fix it on somebody else. What are you trying to fix on yourself, Dr. Arthur? I wish it was mine. Richard Feynman, I give him the credit. It is, uh, that, that, that expression, you're totally, you can never lead someone down a path you've never been down yourself. And if you can't feel this stuff, and, and that's a big thing I tell doctors, if you're not going through and fixing your own problems, man, what are you doing for your patients? Like you should, because the, the, the journey that you go through fixing yourself teaches you so much more. And the only reason why I am a good clinician is because I was a horrible, messed up wreck biomechanically and I had to go fix everything. So more than likely I've been through it myself. Um, to answer your question, John, I am not doing anything right now except for trying to stay alive with two small children. Uh, fair, but, fair. but before that, uh, I was still doing a lot of stall bar stuff. Um, I am still trying to get the side splits, not the front splits, but the side splits. Mm. Um, just for my adductors, what we were talking about to try to loosen them up and I've seen uh, quite a bit of um, improvement in all of those things. You know, using some of the FRS stuff and internal rotation and fixing something else to get something else. Um, I, the, I don't remember the story that I told you with the, the V up thing, but I think what you're talking about is me doing leg lifts on a stall bar yes. and, and just literally feeling like the most wretched individual human ever on earth because uh, I thought that I could do toes to bar and I thought I was super cool. And then I got on a stall bar and took out the ability to hinge and realized I have absolutely no abdominal core. It was just nothing. I couldn't even lift my legs past 90 when I started um, because also I had no mobility in that, in that range mm -hmm. of motion. And so, you know, then learning like, oh, actually, I needed that pelvis to move forward so that my hamstrings could lift up and do these different things. Uh, and so I just started working on it like crazy when I was in Indonesia and got a lot better at it. it but it, it, it makes you, it's very humbling to do gymnastic work and realize why those people are total badasses, because they put in tons of work to do it. Yeah, I guess, I guess the question would be like, what? What would it be one of those? What would be one of those things you've worked on? How long do you work on it individually? And like, how long overall do you does it take to kind of make like the V up change or the some of those groin openers I've seen you do? Like, let, let, let's just pick like one. A, how? Because I, I feel like I know the answer. How long are you working on it? And how long do you think it's been taking you to like make a change? Like, what what is what does that take? years yeah well i don't think it has to take years i think if you're exper you can speed up the process by having someone who's very uh, good at understanding the hacks um, but i appreciate the journey that i go through myself um, and not having someone tell me all the tricks right because i internalize it much more if i go through it and feel it and learn it um, than just jumping to the end because the, the I, I mean I don't really care if I get the side splits I wanted to see what happens with my body and what changed in my own 
physical ability when I would try it. And in the process, I would learn huge limitations that I have uh, and working on those. And then seeing once I clear up those limitations, what, what do I feel like in my workouts and my movements and my CrossFit and all these different things? Like what does it change when you get hip extension? What does it change when you try to get your groin to open up and be able to do a side split? Um, and it, cause it changes a lot of really weird, um, weird things. You don't really, you just know that, man, I can do 50 wall balls now and I'm not even out of breath. What the hell happened? Like all I did was get some mobility in this weird place. Uh, but the overall position got better, you know? And I do, before we end this, I have a question for you two that maybe like stop recording, but I've just found something on myself that it's, it's, I'm still having a hard time, um, understanding why I'm feeling what I'm feeling. So whenever we get to that, I always want to ask. Cool. Actually, that'll, what, be a, that'll be a secret teaser for those of you listening. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bobby will write, write a blog post about our findings. <laughs> yeah. But no, so yeah, no, man, we were, I really want to respect your time in terms of these little boys. Uh, I appreciate it. We've been going really long on this one. There's a bunch of little gems. Uh, if you have any questions, call Steve up any time of day. He'll answer them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Please don't do oh, that. Really? <laughs> I, I don't mind anybody, you know, I, I give my email out to everybody. I would love to hear people that have questions or anything. I mean, my email is Dr. Offenberger at Gmail, like totally like, you know, um, hopefully we can help some people out there, you know, and help some young doctors. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can also call Bobby any time or day. Just remember you're on Iceland hours. Don't bother me though. I'm busy uh, hanging and playing with my cats and stuff. Uh, but thanks again, Steve, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, follow us on Instagram, like us on YouTubes, download the podcast and share it with your friends. Peace. We went long. <laughs>